Welcome to No Budget, the show for filmmakers with no budget by filmmakers with no budget. I'm Milo Dennison. With me is Claire Milan and Cajalfini, and today we are joined by a special guest, J.D. J- J.D. Thompson. Uh, we first met J.D. at the Underground Cinema Film Festival a few years ago, where he was showing his film The Life Exotic, which is about a man we've all heard about now named Joe Exotic, thanks to a Netflix documentary series. Well, J.D. kind of jumped on to Joe first, and so we enjoyed talking to him then. Now with the uh, name Joe Exotic being one that everybody seems to know, we decided to catch up with J.D., see how he's been since then, and kind of maybe uh, see if we can get a bit more insight into his documentary. So thanks, J.D. Thanks for dialing in all the way there from the East Coast of the U.S. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. This is going to be fun. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, so your film was a documentary, like we kind of said, and one of the things I liked about your documentary was that you gave kind of Joe a chance to tell the story, he kind of the way he wanted it to be told versus the way a lot of documentaries kind of really go to sensationalize it. And so we'll probably get into that a little bit later on. Mm-hmm. But I guess the first question is, how did you even meet Joe? Because you met him, like I said, before most anybody else really knew about the guy. Sure, yeah. Uh, I mean, I was working on a totally different story. I was in Oklahoma uh, working on a story. I think I mentioned this to you guys when we did our first interview. So there was a really uh, harrowing case of an uh, unarmed black man that was uh, already subdued by the police when he was shot dead on the ground. And we were doing a documentary into this whole situation. And uh, in the midst of that, uh, we had seen on the news that there was uh, a tornado and the news anchors were warning people, if you're in the Winniewood area, don't go outside because there could be up to 200 tigers on the loose. And so I, I, was, I, I kind of was welcoming the break from the other story anyway, and I told my crew, hey, we, should, we gotta go check this out. You know, look the guy up online. And I was like, I, I gotta, I have to meet this man. <laughs> so, uh, emailed Joe and he said yeah he said basically yeah come on down as long as you let me tell my my side of the story he said there's just been so many news people come to him uh mostly local news at that point you know but come to him and say things you know like yeah we're gonna let you tell your side of the story and then they just did a hit piece on you so it was kind of conditioned on me just letting him tell his side of the story and just kind of presenting a day in the life of Joe Exotic right uh, so, yeah, so, I mean, that was, that was really kind of how it came to pass. It was just seeing that there were up to 200 tigers that, that, that alone was interesting to me, but then seeing who had 200 tigers, I, I, I had yeah. to capture that, you know? So that's, and, then we, and we went down there and did it. The, the, uh, you know, and I don't want to preempt any of your questions, but the, the, the craziest part was that my, you know, we, we here we are in Tulsa, Oklahoma where, you know, police routinely moonlight as professional murderers. And that didn't scare my, uh, my crew too much. But going to the Winniewood GW Zoo, where there's up to 200 tigers on the loose, not to mention Joe Exotic and all his gun-toting cronies, they were like, there's not enough insurance money in the world. We're not going. So I actually, and, and, I, and I didn't have any of my own camera or, or anything. I was using the crew. So I had to go to the photography store buy a camera and i went down there by myself and did the whole thing by myself and you went through a couple of lights too didn't you like if i remember <laughs> yeah. Correctly. yeah like uh... yeah oh yeah yeah we were we, we were uh, in, in one of the interviews we were doing joe you know he lives with all of the liger cubs well they were actually technically little ligers which is when a when a so a liger as you might have guessed is when a lion and a tiger are crossbred now, when you take a liger and you crossbreed it again with a, uh, uh, a lion, then you get a la liger. So there were four la liger cubs running around Joe's house as we were doing one of the interviews. And that in and of itself was nuts because, you know, as cute as they might look, they're still 25 pounds with razor sharp claws and teeth. So I'm sitting here trying to film an interview. The, the, the cubs are climbing my light kids uh, and me, you know, so I'm like, I'm, I literally, I'm like swatting away this <laughs> tiger that's digging into my legs, climbing me, you know, 
So yeah, it was it was completely bananas, man. And then he, oh, not to mention that he had a, an actual like you know 400 500 pound lion right in his front yard it was you know it was just it was completely insane when you say in his front yard was he just roaming freely he well so joe has an enclosure in the front in, in his in his yard but it is not part of the zoo it's just uh it's if you, you know, when you watch the film uh, the the lion's name is bone digger and he just lives there with all of joe's wiener dogs and all of that so yeah, it's just it's just right right there. I mean, it's just a fence you go through, and then there's a door to Joe's house, and it was just nuts, man. I mean, and and the the the, the tigers and the little ligers and all that were just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, he had a kangaroo in his house. He had uh, man, I can't even remember everything, man. There was like baby squirrels, <laughs> like he had, he had you know monkeys. He's just, he's, he's Joe Exotic. What do I, I mean, I don't have to say anything more than that. Man. Yeah, he he, so. meet, he fits the name or the name. Uh, this was before he ran for president, right? Or oh yeah, it? yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, our thing we we shot in twenty fifteen, and honestly, this was uh, this was before a lot of the real crazy stuff had come to pass. So he was re he was a bit different. You know, he was a different character. I don't I don't know how much of it was he realized the marketing power that he could have by being more sensational or how, how, how much he really just kind of became unhinged, you know? You know, it's interesting because I was watching the Louis Thoreau documentary and a tornado mm -hmm. was about to hit the compound and they were afraid the tigers would, would be released. So I wonder, that was, he, he shot before you, didn't he? Maybe, was that around the same time? No, I don't know. I, I think yeah. so. I don't, I, I've honestly, I, I, I know now that he did a piece, but I hadn't, uh, I had never seen it and I didn't even know anything about it. Uh, I mean, I, I liked Louis Thoreau, so I'm sure what he did was a pretty cool piece. Yeah. But I know that Joe didn't feel that anybody had done him justice uh, at, up to that point. I don't know if he included Louis Thoreau's thing in that or not, but, you know, just Louis format, you know, I think he's really good at what he does. And I think he, you know, He's so subtle, you know, I, 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 I so I, I feel like I can kind of envision what that piece was like, but for me, it was, it was a, you know, I, I wasn't really, I don't even, I generally don't even like to put myself in my own work anyway, you know, I, I kind of prefer to just let, let the speakers tell their own story, you know, stitch it together so it makes, you know, a coherent narrative, but I prefer not to narrate, I don't like to, you know, be in frame with people i feel like it that's just that, that's just not my style I don't, you know beyond that i, I you know yeah I, I couldn't really i couldn't really see myself even approaching a story like the louis thoreau approach you know i've seen other things yeah but uh i really wanted just to put joe front and center and let him be himself how long did you spend making your documentary uh well we were on the park for about a week uh, but I stayed in pretty close contact with Joe, uh, honestly, for a long time after and well, well into his, you know, pre presidential bid and everything. There was even talk. Uh, he even, you know, I got a few emails from him saying, uh, you know, I'm looking for a campaign manager. And I said, oh, well, I've kind of got some other things going on. I mean, part of me, in a way, wishes I had done it just for the bar story, you know, but yeah. <laughs> it was... It was kind of a digression, you know, so. And especially uh, and now that we've seen the uh, Netflix series, we all know who the campaign manager is. So he's kind of right, got a little yeah. notoriety out of it that's as well. Been a, yeah, that was, that, that was a good break for him, you know, to get out of working at Walmart and be able to <laughs> get, throw, his, throw his weight in the political arena. I thought that was pretty good. Uh, but as far as making the documentary from top to bottom, you know, shooting everything, uh, it wasn't the only thing that I was working on at the time, but it uh, I spent a lot of time on it. I mean, I was probably spending four or six hours a day on it for almost three months, you know, because the way we had no, we had no idea what we were getting into, you know, I mean, we, we had no idea what, uh, what story we were going to want to tell him, you know? So when I was sh shot, I just shot everything. I hooked Joe up with a wireless lab mic and just let him do his thing. So I had, you know, 
nearly a hundred hours of footage and audio to go through to figure out how to stitch this together in some kind of narrative, you know what I mean? So it didn't just look like, you know, just home videos of Joe wandering around, you know, doing his thing. Yeah. So it took a long time to kind of figure that out, you know, and the other thing that I think this is one thing that really has uh, vexed a few people who haven't looked at the dates is people think that I omitted a lot of the controversy to try to make Joe look good at the time, you know, I, and I'm not, <laughs> I, I, I'm not, that's not a dig, that's okay. but, but, yeah, but, uh, but it could be, I mean, it's, a, I mean, it's just common. People say, Oh, you know, here's this version and that version, you know, and they think that I was omitting some things or holding some things back because of whatever reason, but really what it was honestly was, I didn't even know about those things. And my goal was not to do kind of an expose or a, uh, you know, a, a, I wasn't trying to fact check Joe. I was trying to really just let Joe tell the world who he, who he thought he was, if that makes sense. You know, I saw him as sort of like this mm, mm, I thought I saw him as sort of a, well, I've, what I've said before, I call him kind of this, bizarro Nietzschean Ubermensch who, you know, you've, you've got this guy with no formal education, you know, he didn't come up with money and he's living the American dream or his, his version of it. You know what I mean? He, he, he's a totally self-made man. He's got his harem and his guns and his compound and his wild animals and he's making music videos in his spare time. I'm like, man, this guy, you know, if he was born to money in New York, he'd be the president of the United States right now. Absolutely. You know, and if his dad was in the real estate business and hint, hint, you know, so I think I, I, that's what I saw him was that, you know, this, this is an incredible enterprise that this guy has undertaken with zero qualifications, yeah. you know, and that's America. <laughs> if he wasn't in jail, I think he still could be the president of the United States. To be honest. Yeah. I, I think that if, you know, if, if uh, I think that's why Trump won't pardon him. <laughs> he doesn't want competition. Was exactly. he a cop before Have this? Have been in... in the police force? He was a, uh, a chief of police in a little town in Texas. He's originally from Texas. He, had, he picked Oklahoma, from what I understand, he picked Oklahoma for the park because Oklahoma is really lax on regulation and the land is cheap. You know, so that, uh, I don't think it was from any particular love of Oklahoma, you know. Have you, I know you, uh, he saw your documentary afterwards and was happy with it. Have you been in touch with him other than that, like since then? Or anybody yeah, a little else? bit. Uh, yeah, just a little bit. Um, I will say, you know, don't be fooled by, I mean, you know, there's, there's a lot of sympathy for Joe out there right now. And... I do think that they were heavy handed with him uh, and we can talk about that more later on and why, but uh, as far as him liking the documentary goes, he liked it so much that he tried to steal it. <laughs> I told him, I, you know, I don't generally share any of my work with people that were involved in it until it's out and released just as a, just kind of as a policy, you know, because you, you don't want to get into the, you know, directing through groupthink. So to stay away from all of that, you know, quagmire, I don't do that. But for Joe, since I told him that, well, you know, it was kind of a condition, uh, not, not, I mean, not to see it in advance, but just to make sure he was happy with it, you know? So I did send him a link, but I said, but Joe, under no circumstances, can you share it? Can you post it? Anything? Because it's going to disqualify me from the film festivals and all this. He said, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No problem. And then I get a notification uh, from a friend of mine who says, uh, do you see the documentary is on Joe's channel? I said, what? <laughs> and he says, yeah, check it out. So I checked it out. Not only did he put it on his channel immediately, but he cut my name out of the credits. Oh, no. Mm -hmm. So, so how did that conversation go? Uh, it was pretty quick. It was, Joe, let me introduce you to my lawyer. Uh, take your video down and it was down. So that was, that was, it was relatively simple, but I, you know, I, 
I tried to be a gentleman about it, knowing full well who I was dealing with, you know, and I just, I, I, you know, he was like, Oh, it was a misunderstanding and on and on and on. And I was like, yeah, of course, you know, no, no harm, no foul. You know, so. Have you seen the Netflix documentary? Oh yeah. I was, I got, I did the music for it. And do you, do you feel yeah, we like were wondering about that? So, cause yeah, we saw that you, you've written your name in the credits and stuff. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so we we're kind of wondering like, Sorry, Claire, I know this, this is one of your questions, but so we were kind of wondering about that overlap. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. did, did you find that the, the Netflix one was sensationalized compared to the, the, the man you saw, you, you, you met? Because there's a, there's a, when you, in your documentary, I loved the way you just had Joe sitting down and he seemed more real. You know, it was, mm -hmm. did, you, did you find that he, he was different? He, he came across completely different in Netflix documentary compared to yeah i mean absolutely i think i think there were a lot of uh, there were a lot of variables right i mean when i did my piece with joe his issues his legal issues with carol had only just begun uh he the uh jeff Lowe was not in the picture uh at all i mean he, you know uh travis his late husband who accidentally killed himself had not died uh, so there were a lot of other really, really radical changes in his life that had happened from the time, you know, that I did my piece and, it, you know, I mean, in that pretty short window of time, you know, uh, between my piece and the Netflix piece. Uh, I think the Netflix people did a really great job taking a pretty complicated story and stringing it together in a way that was entertaining and clear. Uh, and I'm... Yeah, I mean, but I would, here's what I would, you know, I, I mean, I have a pretty good relationship with those directors uh, and, and producers at this point, you know, and so uh, I don't think that I would be hurting anyone's feelings to say that their piece was in entertainment and it was conceived to be entertainment from the beginning. And I think that that's the big, uh, you know, misconception uh, about the Netflix piece is people are comparing it to say like making a murderer, right? Which was a deep dive into, uh, you know, the legal side, uh, you know, of, and the corruption and all these kind of things. Whereas this was, you know, there was not a lot of rigorous investigation that was going on in the Netflix series. And I don't think that was ever really their intention. I think it was just to, it was more to entertain, you know, if I'm, if, if I'm, if that's even really the answer to your question. <laughs> and when did the Netflix, how, did they come on after you, you started your, when did they, when did they start filming the Netflix? You know, actually they, they started not very long after me, uh, from what I'm told, you know, I wasn't involved in, in any of that. Uh, but I think that they started, uh, if I remember correctly, like 2016. So maybe about a year or so after I started, after I, I mean, actually after I finished and wrapped my shoots. So it's but, kind of like um, a sequel then, the Netflix, it was a sensationalized sequel. Yeah, I mean, in a way, it was kind of like the before and after. Here's who Joe was, and here's what he was doing, and then here's, and, he, and, and they picked up where I left off. And uh, when, when they got a hold of me about, you know, working with them, it was because obviously I had footage of things that, nobody could ever get footage of again, you know, Joe with Travis and all that stuff. So they, they started off wanting to license, uh, license my footage. And then at the time, uh, you know, Chris Smith, who has done some other documentaries, uh, he did the fire festival thing. He did, uh, the disappearance of Madeline McCann. I think probably the thing he's best known for at least right now, uh, is he did the, the, uh, what's it called? D Jim and Andy documentary about Jim Carrey and his role as Andy Kaufman. So uh, he was at the time the as attached as the director. He since went on to become a, just one of the producers. And somebody in his network had said, "Oh, do you know JD is a you know a musician by trade?" So that came up in our conversations. And then I said, "Well, you know, yeah, I'd be I'd be well into doing the music for the thing." And so I wound up doing a few of the original pieces. Uh, I think actually all of the original music that's in the documentary is mine. Uh, everything else, if, I, if I'm, you know, I, I don't, don't uh, hold me to this, but I'm pretty sure that that's the case and that all the other music was just licensed music. 
I noticed that you, you, the documentary you made, which we watched and reviewed, is actually mm -hmm. no longer online. Did, were you asked to take that down? No, no, no. Uh, I actually just sold it. And so that's part of the, uh, that was part of the terms of the uh, contract that I just, you know, uh, with the company that I just, I didn't actually sell it outright. I licensed the copyright for two years. So in two years, I get all the rights back and, uh, and then we'll see what I do with it from there. Does that include all the, all the, the footage that you took when you were filming? Yeah, I, I, I licensed them basically everything. And, okay. you know, and, 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 uh, and then I'm kind of consulting with them on how to stitch it all together and who's who and, you know, what was going on at the time, you know, and then, uh, they're going to be bringing in, uh, some actual zoologists. They're going to be bringing in some psychologists to kind of basically take the whole thing apart. So I, uh -huh. I'm I'm hopeful that it's going to be a pretty interesting piece, uh, you know. And I'm doing the music for that as well. At, okay. at least that's that's how the agreement is arranged at the moment. So it's like a prequel, in other words. Yeah, really. Yeah, uh, I, and I and I think it's going to be pretty cool. Uh, I mean, you know, I I don't want to swear up and down to anything, and people be like, he said this was going to be great, and it's garbage. It might be. I don't know. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, yeah, but but I think it'll be worth checking out, especially you know people who can get their next Joe Exotic hit. You know? Apparently they're making a film mm -hmm. with Nicolas Cage as a, a Joe Exotic. <sighs> <laughs> yeah, I think somebody's going to regret that decision, but uh, you know, well, not me. It's just <laughs> all this stuff is great for me. <laughs> you know mm -hmm. I, mean? I really wish that they had a cast David Spade. You know, I mean, Jesus, like that's uh, I mean, yeah, so we actually had a separate conversation via chat uh, yeah. about that subject, and that was my vote as well. Was uh, David yeah, Spade. man. I mean, what is what the hell? I don't understand that. I mean, Does obviously, Joe Dirt. I don't know. I mean, you know, I mean, if they can make Sylvester Stallone and Tom Cruise look like they're, you know, not five foot five or whatever, I think that they could handle it. You know, and I just, it just kills me because J David Spade, I think, would be so perfect. I think that that Wes Anderson should direct it, and David Spade should be should should star in it, but. Yep, I'm oh, with you. Oh on my, the, I'm oh with my. you on the David Spade one as well. Like, I mean, yeah. I mean, he's basically almost already played that character. So exactly, man. Yeah, exactly. It would have been <laughs> perfect. Think perfect. Cage but is producing it, so I think yeah, I'm starring in it. Like, well, then that's why he gets the yeah, we, yeah. Uh, that that explains everything because <laughs> <laughs> that's who calls the shots, I guess. You know, that's why this is why I do my things the way I do. You know, I mean, you know. I'm kind of of the Werner Herzog school, you know, like somewhere between Werner Herzog and Jim Thompson, you know, like, uh, not sorry, not Jim Thompson, but uh, Hunter S. Thompson. Oh, okay. uh, Jim Thompson's a different guy, yeah. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I kind of, I like to have the freedom to just make whatever I make and people are into it or they're not, you know, which makes it really hard to raise money, but also makes it really enjoyable to not have to raise money and all the uh, associated baggage it goes with that you know so i do my very best to try to get you know one project to feed the next project uh, you know which i think is the way a lot of uh independent uh filmmakers and uh documentary well of course yeah. yeah yeah absolutely absolutely what absolutely feeds the next uh i was curious because there is footage that's used in both your film and the netflix film like there's a scene where there's a guy that's being um uh questioned like as of being a spy for pete or whatever that was used in both <laughs> yeah yeah like yeah. where did that footage come from was that joe's, that or was that joe's footage so okay. joe, joe licensed a lot of footage to me for you know just uh, there were a lot of things home video type things that i really uh, you know there's a lot of stuff that was on his youtube channel uh that he was like yeah free feel free to use whatever you want but he also had some other really interesting things just kind of in his own archive uh Ooh, I don't know if I should talk about the archive because that's been such a, well, no, let's, we, we talk about whatever we want to, man. It's, it's, yeah. a, it's a free country, at least until November, probably. So. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Is that the archive that uh, got burnt down? Yeah, I, you know, well, so obviously, obviously not because I have it, you know, and, and he was able to give it to me. Yeah. But that whole situation is really, okay, so this is no indictment of the Netflix series or anything but 
uh, you know, the character Kirkman with the boonie hat, the old producer that lived on the park with Joe for so long. Yeah. You know, this whole story about the animal rights people came and burned down the studio and all that, that was what Joe was touting for a long time. And uh, Robert Kirkman is accusing, basically accusing Joe of doing it. I have some other insight into that whole thing uh, that I got well after the fact uh, that neither of those stories was true. And the true story would serve neither Kirkman nor Joe. So uh, the real thing that really kind of freaked me out, though, to be perfectly honest, and this is now fast forwarding to Joe's trial, is that Joe filmed everything. Joe uh, recorded everything because he was constantly being accused of all kinds of various misdeeds. And I cannot believe that these things were not brought up in trial and that this, that, that this footage didn't ever get subpoenaed, mm. you know? Uh, it just makes absolutely no sense to me. It also makes no sense to me that the USDA inspected Joe, uh, I think at least annually, ever since he was open and never shut him down. So, you know, I mean, yeah, here I am as a filmmaker kind of wandering around, the, you know, certain parts of the park. I didn't go inspect the park, you know, I didn't try to fact check anything. Most of my time was just spent showing Joe, showing his tour, showing his, his customers, you know, things like that. I was just trying to get, you know, here's the image of Joe. It, it wasn't in my, I had no interest in fact checking him, fact checking him at the time, you know. So, but the, but the fact that the USDA is the regulatory agency responsible for making sure that these kind of places are to code and fall in all the laws annually goes there. Now, he got a couple of citations for this thing and that thing but nothing like he was charged with, you know, the crimes that he actually got convicted of. So I was really perplexed by how the same federal government that said this place is fine for years and years and years, then said, no, you're going to jail for the rest of your life. Mm. I think that that's really strange. So being from Oklahoma and understanding how the Oklahoma justice system works, uh, I don't think that it was because of a sudden concern for exotic animals, especially when you consider that the, the, the whole state is run by the energy company, energy industry. You know what I mean? Like these are not environmentalists. You know, these are not, you know, so, so I have to think to myself, and I'm not trying to sound conspiracy theory orientated here, but I have to think to myself, what's the variable, right? One day Joe, Joe exotic is fine. The next day he's going to prison, right? What happened in between? What happened in between is he ran for office and embarrassed a lot of state lawmakers. Mm -hmm. I mean, he called out a lot of politicians, uh, some of them by name during his campaign. And as we all now know, the whole world knows, American politicians can sometimes be a little egotistical, petty, even vindictive. And, you know, and that's been the culture of Oklahoma politics as far back as I have researched, you know, probably the beginning of statehood when the Ku Klux Klan pretty much run, ran the place, you know, check out like Mayor Tate Brady, you know, the guy who orchestrated the Klan massacre of North Tulsa and then renamed that black neighborhood after himself, right? This is, these people were in government until the 80s and 90s, you know, mm -hmm. they were young men when they were doing that kind of business. That's the culture of the state. It's incredibly petty and vindictive. So I, I cannot think to myself any other reason why they would have chosen to go after him the way they did when they did if it wasn't for that i mean because you've also got things going on in oklahoma like you know you've got a huge mess and opioid epidemic you've got just all kinds of crime that you would i mean i don't know if you guys just saw in the news recently the the the, the fire chief for the city of tulsa right just went on a bank robbing sp spree no, right? I haven't seen that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. Uh, I mean, and you know, a few years ago, twenty-three Tulsa police officers were indicted with DEA agents for basically stealing drugs from drug dealers and then blackmailing other people into selling them for them. Mm -hmm. Right. This is the this is the kind of stuff that goes on in the state of Oklahoma r relatively routinely. And Joe Exotic. Oh, we got to go get Joe Exotic because he hired some crackhead to go. I mean, come on, guys. That's really what my taxpayer dollars are paying for, you know? 
Hmm. And so to me, it just didn't add up, you know, and there has to be a personal motive in there somewhere, you know, what that is exactly. I'm sure, uh, you know, somebody, I hope somebody watching this will, will take that lead and go and find out the answer and make themselves a billion dollars off their, off the next Netflix series. I'm not going to do it because I don't care anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so were you, were you then surprised by the outcome of the, the court case? Like when he got convicted or? I mean, know? I wasn't, I wasn't surprised because, you know, again, in Oklahoma, if they say you're guilty, you're going to jail, whether okay. you did it or not. You know, I mean, this goes back to the whole Joyce Gilchrist being the forensic investigator for Oklahoma city that sent, you know, dozens and dozens of people to death row on falsified evidence, hmm. you know, you, you know, you've got John Grissom had that documentary come out recently about the guys that, you know, went through this in uh, Southeastern Oklahoma. I mean, if they, if they want you to go to jail in Oklahoma, buddy, you're going to jail and that's all there is to it. So was I surprised? No, was I, you know, and the other thing about it is, I mean, Joe did do the crime, you know, I mean, I, 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 I don't, I'm not, saying Joe's innocent. I'm not even saying he's a good guy. I'm what I'm really concerned with is the rule of law being equitably applied to everybody. And I didn't understand why there are, you know, there's a federal murder for hire case focused on this guy. The only thing I can think of is just that it was political, you know. Are you saying as well, by the way, that that archive material exists? I would, I would, if I were a betting man, I would wager, I would wager strongly that it is there somewhere. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we'll, we'll, let's just, let's just see what happens between now and say, and uh, you know, let I'll, I, I'll take, let's, let's see if we can get somebody at Patty Power or Lab folks to take some action on this, <laughs> whether or not a, a whole new series appears uh, within the next 18 to 24 months with a lot of unbelievably discovered footage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, he, he is appealing. So maybe, uh, maybe it'll come out in the appeal process. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, I think that that's the biggest thing that the Netflix thing did for Joe was it helped him get an actually half decent legal team. Mm -hmm. I have the feeling a lot of this will get overturned. Uh, I'm probably not the, uh, you know, putting down the tigers you know again this is like the fact that they were exotic animals put that into a different legal category the uh you know i mean it's generally illegal to do your own veterinary work right you, you have to do that with a license i think how that's kind of somewhere in the within that legal framework is what really tripped joe up but the other thing people have to remember is you know in rural america almost all people and you know on farms with animals do their own veterinary work and it's illegal for all of them right but they do it because it saves them money you know yeah, and, and we'll these people put their are own animals down you're exactly, exactly right like, exactly exactly you have grown up in rural america as well yeah and, exactly so I, mean, yeah. I i really i think in joe's mind he was just doing what he did when he was a kid growing up on the farm it didn't even you know i think that by that point since most of those animals were born in captivity uh, and the other ones that were rescued uh, that he had on the park, you know, most of these animals had, had never ever been in their natural habitat. So I don't think that Joe necessarily processed it. Doesn't make it, make it okay, obviously, but I don't think he processed it as, you know, killing endangered species, right? Because these, these, these species aren't, like I say, they were never in the wild in the first place, yeah. you know, tragically. I think that that's also the other thing personally, and I don't want to get on too much of a, a, a tangent about this, but to me, I really think the most compelling uh, situation that w in, in this whole saga is why in the world are there more tigers in captivity than there are in the wild? That is a far more uh, important question that sh someone should explore uh, than, you know, whether Carol Baskin killed her husband or whether or not Joe Exotic, you know, did whatever Joe Exotic did, you know, these, those, and, and I will say also, I've become pretty good friends with Manny Oteza, who was one of the producers for Blackfish. Mm -hmm. uh, and he is also working on a Joe Exotic story that's going to be a lot more of a sort of Blackfish treatment of this, uh, you know, a lot more of a, 
a, a journalistic kind of deep dive into the to the big cat industry, you know, and all of its dealings. So I, I'm really looking forward to that. I'm and I'm I've kind of we we, we haven't partnered on that uh, in any kind of official way or anything like that, but we talk about it a lot. You know, he calls me about it. You know once a week or so ever since he started this and uh i i i foresee that being a pretty worthwhile venture if joe gets out of prison what do you think he'll do i think he's going to get so rich i think everybody in the world that's been violating his intellectual property rights is going to get their asses suit off you know i mean there's so many you know, there's so much joe exotic everything out there i mean you know i can't I, I, uh, every day i don't even i don't even follow the hashtags or any of that stuff right you know i mean because i'm just i was to here with joe exotic in 2016 you know what i mean and and now you know so uh, but i just i get everybody see something funny joe exotic a shirt uh you know a, a covid mask or whatever you name it there's something joe exotic out there and I don't know that anybody licensed any of that stuff. So I think everybody's relying on him going away forever, but he's got a legal team and he's got heirs and we'll, we'll yeah, that's probably not the, that's probably not the answer you were looking for. But mm -hmm. What are you, yeah, I mean, t is there something else you're scratching at there? No, I was just wondering, cause he, he's probably <laughs> loving the, he's probably feeling frustrated in, in prison that he can't be out there and enjoying all this publicity. He, 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 so, he loves you know, publicity, you know? Oh yeah, I mean, honestly, uh, as you could see in my documentary, you know, he talks a lot of, I, you know, ironically, kind of that, you know, he, I've built my own prison, he says, you know, I'm literally in my own prison, he says, you know, when, and now he literally is in prison, I think there's a big difference for him and he knows, you know, that uh, careful what you wish for, but I would say, there's an element of relief, I think, you know, I mean, I, I'm not in direct contact with him right now because it's really hard to do. Uh, I'm in contact with people who are in direct contact with him and, you know, uh, he's not even seen the Netflix series. So everything he knows that's going on in the world outside is all just secondhand people telling him. I think though that we, it would be safe to assume that Joe's overarching modus operandi is attention and I think he's finally achieved that and I think that I think he'll probably die a happy man wherever he is mm -hmm. you know do you think he will get out you know uh, yeah, yeah I mean that's I'd, I'd rather I'd, I'd rather tell you what number is going to hit on the roulette table <laughs> than what's going to happen in the legal system in America these days but I think he's got a pretty good case because I think the murder for hire component of the charges against him uh, are pretty flimsy. And I, especially when you consider that there, you know, the, the, the people that were responsible for setting him up essentially are also the people that profited by his conviction. You know, I think that there's, I think that there's, there's, you know, and of course I'm not an attorney. I've talked to some attorneys who have, uh, have kept up with the case uh and there's a lot of there's a lot of optimism that that particular charge will be overturned i have a hard time thinking that the animal rights violations you know will be overturned and i don't necessarily think they should should be overturned you know i mean i it's hard to you know it's really hard when you're working on a documentary it's strange you know i mean you guys know this when you're editing something you feel you get you develop this connection with the people that you're editing that is strange because you, you you've you've watched all of their subtle ticks you've you know what i mean and you've just trolled through not only the things that they do and say but you're also looking for the meaning behind it and you develop this weird relationship with the virtual character that's frozen in time you know that is not necessarily who that person is and they doesn't don't necessarily reciprocate it and there's a part of me i have to confess just as Joe is a human being, I hate to see a human being go through that. But at the same time, don't do the crime if you can't do the time, you know? I didn't realize that the uh, animal abuse was uh, part of the conviction. I just thought it was all for the murder to hire. No, it, it was, I think, honestly, uh, I think he got, if I remember correctly, I think that he was convicted on two or three counts of, of, 
animal abuse might be the wrong term. I, it, it, it was whatever the technical legal term is for putting down endangered species. I'm pretty sure that that was what it, that's the long and short of it. Uh, yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and I don't, uh, you know, he, he did it. It's against the law. You know, do a lot, you know, do people do it all the time? Sure they do, but only a few people get caught, you know? So I, you know, that's just, the, that's, those are the risks you take when you walk the, the edge that Joe Exotic walked. I mean, that was part of why I had to do the, do the film too, you know, because I, I, people say, man, you know, like I, I get the, this one production company that ha we, I just made a deal with for some other things. Now, the, the reason why they're like, what other stories are you working on? You know, you beat Netflix to this by five years. Mm -hmm. What, you know, they, you know you're like the story truffle pig right now mm -hmm. is what they called me. And I, and I was like, well, man, I mean, it's just common sense. You got a bunch of untrained people with a bunch of wild animals partying guns and and the general public this cannot go go on there cannot be a happy ending to this you know what i mean there's just, there's, there's something is going to happen in that whole constellation of madness and i want to be the guy that has the footage to, to, to me it was something was bound something like this was bound to happen honestly this is probably the best thing that could have happened if you really think about it no one was mauled to death by any tigers. Nobody actually died. You know what I mean? I mean, in, you know, really kind of zooming out for all of the volatility and volatile people in that volatile situation, you know, I mean, apart from, you know, poor Travis, you know, accidentally shooting himself. I don't think that it could have ended any better than it did, for, you know, for, for humanity. <laughs> you know what I mean? Not for poor stupid joe mm. uh, yeah. do you think the par park is gonna stay stay in business with the with what's his name owning it now like oh it's not man. looking too good yeah i don't think so i mean i don't i also don't think we've uh, you know i think there's enough pressure now uh public pressure that people are going to start looking into that guy pretty hard and i think they're going to find a lot more in his you know a lot more skeletons in his closet than they ever did in joe's you know joe was just uh, you know, Joe is kind of harmless in his way. He's he is an egomaniac, and he'll 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 fudge things here and there. You know, I mean, he's the kind of guy that would add an addition onto his house without getting council planning permission. That's about the extent of his criminality, for the most part. You know what I mean? And I really think the whole murder for hire thing. I mean, no, 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 let me take a step back. You know, somebody said to him, "Let's kill Carol Baskin." He said, "Okay, right." I mean, there's no disputing that. But I think when you spend time with him, you start to realize that Joe likes to present himself as kind of a tough guy, you know? And I think that Jeff Lowe is a really, really good con man. And a really good con man understands how to manipulate a person's sense of ident identity. And I think that he just, he was like, I could present this to Joe and say, Joe, Here's what the tough guys want to do. And we're the tough guys. We're, your angel, we're not only your angel investors, right? We're not only your money men, but we're also the, the, the tough guys that are going to get things done for you in your network now. And here's a way that we could possibly address the situation, unless you're a pansy, you know? And they wouldn't, they wouldn't say that explicitly to him, but I think that that's how it was presented to him. And Joe's like, yeah, because Joe talks shit all day, every day about everything. You know what I mean? And I think to Joe, that was just more trash talking for, for the most part. You know, uh, did he yeah. have a real, I mean, he, he did have a real gripe with Carol Baskin. And I think the Netflix series was right to show how, you know, don't antagonize crazy people for crying out loud. I mean, Joe Exotic is a bit of a wild card. And she had this team of people more or less harass him out of business definitely once when he was doing his road show and then they then that wasn't enough they wanted to harass him out of business you know after after that so i uh, you know i mean you, you know it's you you mess with the bull you get the horns you know and i think that that's kind of what what happened but i also think that he was really goaded you know it's fascinating. I think yeah, yeah. it's only the <laughs> beginning of this Joe Exotic 
story. You know, and it, it's brilliant that you you basically got in there first, or you were in the first documentary makers. So I just think it's it's such a fascinating, fascinating story, and it's on a, on a worldwide stage now. So it's it's going to keep running and running, I think. Yeah, I got really, I did, I got really lucky to be able to get in kind of at the ground floor, and I don't want to take anything away from any of the people that you know. Well, like Louis Thoreau, you know, as you mentioned, you know, who did their little piece on it and stuff like that. I feel really lucky uh, and happy that I was able to do the first feature length piece on him. I was really kind of happy just on a personal level to be able to make the first showing of it in Dublin, just because that's kind of where I, I don't know, that's where a lot of my, I moved to Ireland, you know, when I was like 21. And uh, that was where I really felt like I kind of started to find myself creatively. You know, I was just surrounded by the right people at the right time. And so I kind of felt like it was an important thing for me to come back with, you know, what I, taking the skills that I had sort of developed in Ireland, came back to America, gathered some things up, and then I started, you know, bring it back to, to share with the, with the people that, kind of gave me the drive to do what I do, you know? So uh, what are you personally working on at the moment? Uh, well, I'm working on a few things. Actually, I'm working on uh, a documentary about the revival of uh, the pre-Christian Norse religion in Iceland. Uh, I spent a lot of last year around, you know, in Iceland and Scandinavia interviewing um various people connected to that. Uh, and I'm really excited about that because I think it's going to be a really, really cool, I think it's going to be a really cool story when it's all said and done. The other thing that I work, that I've been working on just as a kind of a fun little side piece is a, uh, a story about a Vermont werewolf legend uh, that is kind of the backdrop to a bunch of missing persons cases. So you can find that. I put a little short of that up online. Um, uh, it's called Hunting the Hound of Cold Hollow. So if you guys are up for a little spooky, funny short, check that out. Is that on your YouTube channel? It's on a different YouTube channel. Okay. That, that's, I try to, try to make sure that it's very clear what I do journalistically and what I do sort of just for entertainment. I like to make sure that there's a really clear divide so that there's no confusion. You know, so this is for this, you know, I don't actually think there are werewolves, you know, so, but some people do. And I, and I wanted to let them tell their story because that's crazy. When I was doing all this stuff, I got a friend who's, he, uh, he's passed away now, but he's a, he was a really well-known movie poster artist. His name's Bruce Eagle. And, uh, he, you know, he did like the poster for Dark Crystal and a bunch of Disney stuff, like in the eighties and nineties. And, uh, he, and we would we were talking about these kind of like paranormal phenomenon just for yucks one day, and he was telling me about this ghost encounter he had had. And I said, "Bruce, how do you know it was a ghost?" And he said, "What do you, what do you mean? I, I mean, obviously it was a ghost." I was like, "Yeah, but how do you know it wasn't like you know, it wasn't an alien?" He's like, "I don't understand the question, man. What do you mean? I, I, I know the difference between ghosts and aliens." I was like, <laughs> "How do you know the difference between ghosts and aliens?" He says, "I've been painting ghosts and aliens and monsters my whole life. I think I know the difference." <laughs> I, thought, I, I, I thought that was pretty cute. Good so, answer, that's a good response. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, so we'll wrap it up, uh, JD. If people want to track you down in any way, how would they get in touch with you? Uh, well, Instagram, Twitter. The, the, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. You know, the old, the old internet. That's you know, I'm, somebody out there has got. I'm sure posted my my deets. So uh, I have a website, uh, ThompsonAutomatic.com. Uh, so you can check out kind of some of the things that I'm working on there. It's got some links to music projects. Uh, I think there's a contact form, you know, so if anybody wants to send me any hate mail, by all means, I've gotten about a thousand threats from various animal rights people for making Joe Exotic look like a human being already. So mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> yeah, which <laughs> I'm just blown away by, you know, I'm like, guys, I'm not saying he's a good guy. I'm just saying he's a guy. Check it out. But I get it. I get it. I get it. So yeah, that's yeah. Thompsonautomatic.com uh, and shoot me a line. Shoot me a line if you've got some crazy stories of some you know, werewolves or polyamorous gay uh, gun enthusiasts mm -hmm. with 187 tigers. I'm I'm into that. So. Perfect. Okay. All right. Well, thanks a lot, JD. Thanks for uh, coming back on the show with us, and glad that you're doing well. 
Thank you. Thank you guys for having me and thank right. you for keep doing this thing. I think it's really cool that you guys focus on no budget. I, I just think that that's, there, there are so many unsung heroes out there these days. That's the idea of the show. Right. Good, good work, fellas. All right. All right. Thanks, Thanks man. Thank you so thank much. Thank you, Kyle and, and, and Etal. <laughs> <laughs> All right. See you then. Perfect. Thanks, man. All right. So, Bye. uh, Bye.